Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 2% Better Health Podcast. I am your host, Carrie Bennett, and today I'm super excited to chat with Zeb. Uh, Zeb, what's your last name? Riker? Riker, I don't want to mispronounce it. Hackett Riker. It's hyphenated. Oh, okay. Awesome. Awesome. Wonderful. So this is a cool thing. So Zeb and I were just chatting before we started, we, we hit record, about how we're, we've connected and kind of how social media has brought together the, the weird quantum tribe of people from around the world. And like, you know, Zeb was just saying that everyone kind of knocks on social media for being a distraction or an issue, but it's through social media that I get to connect with people like Zeb. And um, we just kind of have this shared understanding of this, the, the quantum space of nature, of circadian biology. And so Zeb, I'm really excited to chat with you today because um, I want to hear about what got you to this space, uh, you know, and how you use quantum healing techniques. Because I think the more we can talk about it and just show how people integrate it into their everyday lives, the more that this is going to be accessible, the more people are going to are, are going to start to apply this, notice the difference, and we're going to like reach this critical mass where we're no longer like the weirdos among our friend <laughs> among our friend groups, and maybe like this will start to become the new norm. So welcome to the show, Zeb. I'm excited to chat with you today. Yeah, I am too. And thank you for having me, Carrie. It's, uh, it's good to meet you in person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, likewise. Absolutely. So, so it's, uh, it's been a long journey, you know, oh, to cool. kind of start from square one, I guess, it was probably my decision to go paleo in mm-hmm. 2011, which was like the hot topic, you know, so hey, it was right. this, the first time I was really hitting the gym at 21, 22 years old, getting into protein, getting into pre workouts, getting into all that stuff. And then realizing that bread's probably not the best food to to (laughs) eat. So that was kind of like the first thing, like, oh, I'll cut out bread and I'll start working out. And then since then, it's been absolutely down the rabbit hole. So that was in, like I said, 2011. And uh, I guess the progression from there, uh, you know, I've tried every single diet. I've, I've been keto, I've been carnivore, I've been vegan, I've been fructarian, I've been you know, you name it, I've done it. So after, after that, uh, I guess, first kind of look into the workout health fitness world, um, the first real decision I made to start jumping into health research was after my stint in the oil field. So uh, after college, I worked as a field engineer in oil and gas. So I was living on location all over the Western and Southwestern United States and I was working night shifts. So your, your uh, you know, followers all know, my followers know how, how detrimental that is to our circadian rhythm. So I was you know, waking up at 5 p.m., rolling over to the office at 6, and then working until 6 a.m. under blue lights, mostly in front of a computer screen uh, in an uh, in, in oil drilling situation where oftentimes you're in kind of a basin that's absolutely you know, the, the air quality is terrible. So that, that, uh, that job entailed working for, you know, months straight or, you know, different, uh, kind of days on days off cycles where I'm 20 days on 10 days off, or, you know, two months on a month off. So in these environments for an extended period of time. And, and during that, my skin got absolutely terrible. And then on top of that, you know, when you work for two months straight, you walk away with some money and you've got a month off and you're going to be partying and, you know, living very vicariously. So that all started to add up. And uh, in 2015, oil prices crash and every young gun got laid off. And honestly, it was it was a blessing in disguise (laughs) because I got I got to step back and be like, okay this isn't healthy. I need to fix my skin. And on top of that, I wanted to find out a way to, to help my parents as they age, avoid any of the long-term health situations that I saw my grandparents go through on my mom's side. uh, Both my grandparents had Alzheimer's dementia, that type of thing. And I thought, you know, I I don't want to deal with a losing my parents in that fashion, and then be the costs associated with it, with memory care units and all that stuff. So I, I started researching at that point. I was like, okay, so what is Alzheimer's? What is dementia? I have uh, an aunt on that side of the family with MS. I was like, what is MS? 
Um, I had a very mild vitiligo that I've had since I was like eight or nine. I was like, okay, so what's vitiligo? And that, that brought me to the understanding that autoimmune diseases are not a disease, but rather this like systemic metabolic imbalance. So the first thing I keyed on in on was methylation. And I under, started to learn that, you know, the, the mutation on the MTHFR gene can lead to an inefficiency in processing folic acid. And the downstream effects from that lead to an inability to process histamine or metabolize homocysteine that leads to kind of this inflammation cascade. So I was like, how can I start to fix methylation and repair methylation? And that's really when I transitioned, you know, from the kind of paleo eating to strictly no carbs, no gluten, um, and, and still wasn't very well versed in what I should be eating. But that was, you know, the first time I started to look at specific supplements, like, a, you know, methylated B12, anything that would ramp up that, that, um, that methylation pathway. So that was in 2015, 2016, those, that, those were the years I was starting to kind of first put things together. And during, during that time, I stumbled across uh, CBD. And, you know, a lot of you guys know that that's part of my business, uh, selling CBD and a big part of, of the background of the last three years of my uh, career. And the thing about CBD that I really liked was that it had all the benefits of cannabis without the intoxicative effects. I went to school in Boulder, Colorado mm. during the first wave of medicinal marijuana. You know, we went and got our med cards at the sketchy pawn shop type doctor's yeah. office in Denver in 2009. You know, you, you walk in and there's just like a little curtain set up in the back corner and you go back there. And I was like, well, doc, you know, when I, when I'm skiing bail four times a week, sometimes my knee hurts, you know, and he's like, Oh, don't worry. We'll get you a prescription for that. So <laughs> I saw that. And, and, you know, at first I was like, Oh, plant medicine, this is awesome. But then as that kind of evolved in 2011, 2012, I was like, this is really abuse of something that is very helpful. You know, people are just trying to get high. Everyone's just trying to get inebriated. But so I came across CBD and I was like, here's something that actually makes sense. It's the medicinal qualities. It doesn't have the intoxicative culture or effects of, of uh, marijuana and kind of the whole medical marijuana culture. So I, I jumped into the industry and I was uh, trading physical commodities at the time. And I was like, you know what, these burgeoning markets have a lot more opportunity as far as margins. Um, and then on top of that, if I could align that with something I truly believe in, you know, that's, that's what they say you should do, follow your passion and then apply what you know you're good at. So I moved down to Kentucky um, to start a, a CBD company. And over the course of the next several years, this was 2018 through 2021, um, built up a farming network uh, and then brought in some contacts from the oil and gas industry to build a, a midstream processing company in southwestern Kentucky. And, you know, the 800 acres of plant material coming in to commercially dry to get down to a refined state to take to extractors across the nation. And then my job was uh, primarily involving moving products within the wholesale market. So uh, crude oil, distillate, isolate. Anyways, that that's the background, but yeah. CBD was kind of like this, this supplement, kind of the first window into the supplement world where I was like, here's a natural supplement that activates this endocannabinoid system that promotes homeostasis at a systemic level. And that's something that you can take to kind of bring that inflammation down while you're targeting methylation. So I saw it as kind of this band-aid where, hey, take this while you're implementing some of this, these other protocols to really bring the metabolism back to baseline. So from there, it, it's been down the rabbit hole because the CBD space opened my eyes to the business world and specifically the supplement world. So I, I guess it's been a, a faster learning curve since probably 2019, you know, it was 2011 through uh, 20, 2018, that was kind of the steady growth. And then it just went parabolic. 
like everything these days, right? right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that's really cool because um, I think you're, you hit the nail on the head. Like there comes this threshold. Like once you get down this rabbit hole of healing and how does my body actually heal itself? And it's like, wow, when you're hooked, you're hooked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so before we, okay, I want, I want to know what goes, what goes on from, from here, right? But I'm, I'm intrigued, right? Because I love the fact that you have chosen to grow. I'm assuming, is this in an outdoor? Is this an outdoor acreage that you're growing? Yes, yes. Beautiful, right? Because we're looking at a plant that's actually getting a quantum yield of sunlight, right? It's a plant that's actually absorbing the sun the way it comes from nature, as opposed to CBD that's potentially grown from plants that are grown in a what would you call it a hydroponic style or I'm not that well versed on, on growing of, of, uh, marijuana plants, but so, so talk, can you talk a little bit about that? Cause I think this is important for people to recognize because when, when we get something that comes from nature and how nature impacts it, it's like the same thing as eating something that grows where we live versus eating something that was maybe grown in a, in a greenhouse versus something that's grown in a, in a different location. So can you talk a little bit about why you chose to go outside with your growing? Yeah, exactly. And you keyed immediately in on it. Um, and that's the interesting thing about cannabinoids is because they are photosensitive and they change according to what sort of sunlight and what sort of light spectrum they're getting. So yes, the importance of growing all of your food, anything you're ingesting locally so that it's in the same circadian rhythm that you're in. So you've got the same electron spin, you know, that whole kind of Rudolf Steiner approach to agriculture is, is ultra important, but even more important when you're growing a supplement. So aside from the, the cannabinoid profile of the plant changing real time under the influence of the sun, you can do the same thing with the extracts. And that's actually why we chose to do clear bottles. And that's why the company's name is clearly. Oh, because, interesting. So okay. As as everyone jumped into this industry, they're they're like, oh, you need UV protective bottles, brown or blue, so that it doesn't degrade the cannabinoids. And I'm like, degrade the cannabinoids? No, you expose the cannabinoids to the sun, and then the sun will arrange the proper ratios of each one, and then you'll be ingesting essentially what the sun's programming. Wow. So it's, yeah, talk about it kind of a nonlinear quantum approach. I'm like, you know, you've got your base ingredients, you've got CBG and you've got CBD, and then you put that in the sunlight and then it'll turn that into CBDV and CBDA and like all these other things in different proportions that you wouldn't see from a plant just straight out of the field. That is so, so cool. That's, that is cool that, that you identified that. And that's, yeah you know, with, with, with hemp, with marijuana, a, a very key aspect, but also with our food. I mean, eating locally and eating the, the seasonally with things that are tuned in with your own circadian rhythm are, I mean, that's infinitely important to health in my, in my perspective. Yeah, I, I concur completely. So, okay. So side note, right. This is just my nerd brain wanting to know this. I've never actually seen what, a, what a molecule of CBD. Are there a bunch of photon traps? Are there a bunch of benzene rings? Do you know in CBD? I believe there are. It's like, it's like kind of, it's like a three chain with a little tail. Yeah. Interesting. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure if you took a look at that, you could dissect it much more uh, professionally than I could. I'm sure. It's, yeah, I'm just sure. I'm sure it's just waiting to trap the light. Right. I mean, I'm absolutely mm -hmm. certain of that. That's that's really cool. That's really neat. So um, a very fascinating approach, too, because sometimes people do need like uh, uh, something to assist them on their healing journey, you know? And so it's like my, my go-to for people. Um, I mean, obviously I always want people, it's like, I want you to see the sunrise. I want you to get as much natural light as possible ground, you know, be one with nature, infrared, cold, um, block the artificial light, which are all very important. But for someone who is, you know, already has, you know, something like MS, right. Or fibromyalgia or, or an, an autoimmune immune condition, Sometimes it's important to have something that can really support the anti-inflammatory properties the process of the body. And so CBD, mm -hmm. what, that was your go-to personally as you were kind of transitioning or, and, or what, and like, what are some testimonials or things that you've heard of clients when they're trying to kind of transition into this more natural approach to healing? Yeah. So it's that, that was my first approach. Cause it's like, it's the thing that buys you some more time mm -hmm. to implement the other things that you need to ultimately reverse the condition that you have. Cool. And 
as we know, some of the things that you need to basically hit right off the bat are blood sugar. You know, that's a huge one. CBD helps lower blood sugar, helps kind of get that whole process working. So, uh, yeah, I, I think the biggest results I've seen are, are weight loss and lowering of blood sugar. And then, you know, people are, are able to start uh, implementing some of the other stuff. So with anyone who's got an autoimmune condition, I say cut carbs, start taking CBD, start taking 1,000 milligrams of niacin a day. So you start to get into ketosis, you start to burn all your excess fat, you start to kind of clear a lot of the heavy metals within the system. Um, and that's why I also include Shilajit in that recommendation is because you're able to start chelating. And that was a huge piece that I figured out uh, when targeting methylation is that in order to get that pathway ramped up, you need to chelate. Because over our lifetime, the older we get, the more metals accumulate in the body you know, through our diet, through our environment, through tap water, through all this stuff, dental products. And at the end of the day, those heavy metals are attached to cofactor binding sites that would otherwise be absorbing micronutrients and minerals like zinc and magnesium and the things that keep our metabolism running. So it's like, at the end of the day, I, th I think a huge part of my thesis is the, the slowing down of the metabolism is what leads to disease. And the root cause of that is heavy metals and things that are disrupting our uh, cofactor binding sites and enzyme um, enzymes, you know, so, Absolutely. so chelating, adding in CBD to kind of keep the inflammation quelled as you're getting the, the micronutrients from the shilaji at the same time you're chelating and then the thousand milligrams of niacin that's kind of like my baseline from, from a physical kind of metabolic standpoint. And then obviously everything you need to do to lock in circadian on top of that is like the next recommendation. That awesome. No, that's, that's a really, really cool approach. I, I and I don't think, I've, I don't think anyone has, has ever mentioned Sheila Jeep before on the show. So let's talk about what that is because it's cool. <laughs> I mean, this is another, this is another, um, I guess, supplement, if you will, well, for lack of a better term, that has, it, it touches quantum because it has like this perfect combination of like ancient usage meets modern science. And now we, that, that's what quantum, that's what quantum biology is for me. And so talk about this, you know, I don't think anyone knows what it is or why it would chelate. And so how, what, what is Shilaji? What, what got you into that and go for, go for it. So it, it was actually one of the first supplements I came across, but I didn't really appreciate uh, how robust it was. And now that I've kind of come full circle, I'm like, oh my God, I, I first tried this in 2017 and this was the answer in 2017. So yeah, it, it is, I guess, the oldest supplement. It's uh, considered like the original Ayurvedic medicine. So Shilajit is this resinous material that uh, lies within the Earth's crust. And it's found in mountain ranges across the world because they've been pushed up from the Earth's crust. So you're able to actually get, and it's it's a lot like uh, oil or petroleum. It's basically broken down plant matter and stuff that's pressured through heat uh, and time uh, into this oil-like form. So it's found in mountain ranges across the world. Uh, it's, uh, you know, oozes from rocks. It's, uh, it's rich in fulvic and humic acids. It's got like 85 trace minerals in it. So you're getting your potassium, magnesium, selenium, all those important things. Um, and at the same time, it's got a really high concentration of carbon 60. And I think that's where we get into the most quantum aspects of, of what Sheila Jita is. Because as you know, carbon 60 is this dodecahedral platonic solid that's loaded with electrons that essentially is free energy. It's a huge antioxidant. You know, it does all these amazing, amazing things. It wow. uh, is super good for your DNA and that it stabilizes hydrogen bonds. So it, uh, um, you know, the, and, and Shilaji, it blows my mind every day when I find papers, this is on like, you know, biweekly basis where I stumble across a paper. And yesterday I was looking and Shilaji has been proven to, uh, negate the effects of 5G radiation because of the ability for it to wow. stabilize hydrogen bonds within DNA. Wow. So, That's cool. Yeah. So I guess to, to break it down, the, the fulvic acid 
is the chelator. So that's what's going to be binding to heavy metals and pulling heavy metals from the body. Um, it's, it's, it's got the ability to enter cells with ease because of its negative ionic charge. And that's how it's more efficient at delivering those micro minerals and nutrients. Um, so the fulvic acid is, is definitely a huge aspect. Um, 85 trace minerals, self-explained. Um, and then, yeah, the, the C60 is like a free electron carrier. So similar to, you know, your conversations about red light and exclusion zone water and free energy, energy derived from sunlight, this is one more thing where you can actually get electrons from outside of a caloric source. So for me, it's like, okay, if, if I'm keto, if I'm cold plunging, if I'm uh, getting infrared light or, you know, full spectrum light, you know, during the summer and stuff, and I'm getting shilajit on top of that, you hardly need calories. It's like, you can just thrive off of hardly anything. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful, and that dodecahedral shape of the carbon 60, as, as many of you may know, is like the lotus flower. So the lotus flower of life, that, that pattern, that is everything is Sheila Jeet. So it's said that Sheila Jeet is potentially like the lifeblood of earth. Like that's the, that's the, the manifestation of the light wavelength that is everything earth-like. Wow. Um, and he, this is this is purely anecdotal, but I've heard that Shilajit flows along the ley lines of the earth. Wow. And that is actually so cool. contributes actually contributes to its resonance. So when we're talking about, you know, the, the Schumann resonance and the resistance between the Earth's crust and the ionosphere, that the partial reason for that is the charge that the Shilajit within the crust holds. Which so that's mind this, <laughs> that's, it, it, it's absolutely mind blowing. So then, I mean, I, I, my brain goes to, you know, ingesting it with the electrons, but you also get that frequency signature that mm -hmm. basically makes you a better emitter and receiver of the, mm -hmm. of the Schumann. I mean, you right. You could, can connect that much more powerfully to the, to those resonance frequencies. Exactly. Holy and, cow. And that yeah. for me, you know, when we're talking about quantum health, what does that mean? And it's, it's organic intelligence. And that's kind of this thing that I've been posting a lot and been blogging a lot about lately is this natural intelligence where it's like, we get this information from the sun, we get this information from the plants, we get this information from these things that are of earth and that's what keeps us healthy and that's what keeps us human. And I think the whole human aspect of life is being able to draw from kind of this ether and bring it into the manifest. And the more conductive you are, the more efficiently you can do that. So everything for me is about breaking out of the blue light matrix and becoming more organically intelligent because yeah. that's, you know, that's the that way that we thrive and the way we're meant to live. You, I couldn't say it any better than that. That's that's beautiful. Um, I think that Sheila G is gonna just basically based on what you said about. 5G um, and 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 you know non-native electromagnetic fields, but I also think that because we are just we are, we live a disconnected lifestyle, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. I don't see people wanting to just you know camp in their backyards. Mm -hmm. um, but that's interesting to have an alternative source of electron density, like like an electron rich source, and I think that that Sheila Jeet's could play a huge role in the future mm -hmm. for people. Now, what's the difference? Like, are there different extraction methods for that? Do you know anything about that? Like what's the best source people could get? Well, I source mine from the Altai mountains in Russia and it's water extracted at lower temperatures. So you're not degrading any of the nutrient content. So um, I know it's, it's like a five day water soak where you're centrifuging throughout that to kind of get rid of debris because some of the shilajit will be harvested in more of an oil form but some of it is within rocks just like petroleum so it's this process of crushing the rock soaking it centrifuging out the debris and essentially going through this water distillation process and then at the end you're doing a low temperature vacuum evaporation so you're not you know you're trying to kind of get rid of as much water as possible, but without utilizing heat. So I know that's the, the best way to preserve the nutrient integrity, um, but I'm, I'm not sure about what other brands are using or, or what other people are using. I'm 
most likely it's it's the same method. I've tried a whole bunch of shilajit and you know, it's all more or less the, the same as long as you're getting it in a resinous form. Cool. Wow, that's so great. I actually just started taking shilajit probably two months ago or so, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to kind of continue, especially, I mean, with it being cold where I live, cold and dark and gloomy, it's like, I'm excited to kind of see what it feels like. Um, in, I, I feel great in the middle of winter, but I'm, I'm like, I think that helps, but I'm also excited to see what it feels like in the middle of summer when mm-hmm. I'm outside way more, you know, um, mm-hmm. pretty much all day long. <laughs> so it, it's an interesting one because also, you know, uh, it, we don't think about it, but like minerals, they're, they're essential. Like we give so much credence to vitamins, right? You know, it's like vitamins, 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 vitamins. And I'm not saying that we don't need like vitamins, but I just feel like minerals play such a more foundational role in the body. And the majority Mm -hmm. of people, like you said, are heavy metal toxic. They have mineral imbalances. What would you suggest someone who wants to explore their toxicity and their mineral status? Do you do any sort of testing? I have never done any testing. Um, I'm definitely kind of the cowboy biohacker where I self-experiment before I really do anything, you know, too expensive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, I guess that my my chelation process started with a couple amino acids. So I sourced uh, sulfur-based uh, amino acid DMSA, if you're familiar, mm-hmm. uh, as well as our lipoic acid and mm. did the Andy Cutler protocol. Oh, okay, so I don't I, know that one. Yeah, it's, it's a good one to look up, but basically uh, these chelators you have to take on their half-life because you don't want to be pulling metals from the body environment and then allowing them to dissipate before you pass them through. Mm. So it's, it's a little bit intense, but you essentially calculate uh, based upon your body weight, based upon what you think your metal toxicity approximately is a milligram dose that you're taking on a three hour basis, 24 hours a day for four days straight, 11 days off. Mm. So it's a four on 11 off that you start with the DMSA to pull from the body environment. And then after six months, a year of that, you implement the RLA because that's able to pass the the blood brain barrier. And you want to kind of have a clean body environment before you're pulling metals from the brain. So uh, I've never tested my my metal toxicity, but I would go so far as to say that if you live a modern lifestyle, you're metal toxic. You know, yeah. Yeah. if you're if you're skinny, you probably have less metals. If you're fat, it's probably because you're slowly building metals up within your system. Interesting. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. That's a really interesting protocol. Um, I do also feel like in general, the DS, D, DMSA, the the sulfur based. Um, the chelator, if you will, or detoxifier, it, I, I think it's really, I think we have a sulfate, a, a, a naturally have a sulfate mm-hmm. deficiency, right? And so just going kind of to the exclusion zone water that we alluded to a little bit earlier, it's like that we need sulfate in order to make that exclusion zone water that covers every single surface of every single cell. Um, and so one of the, and so one thing that we can do is we can sulfate things via sunlight, right? That's that's the thing. But I think ultimately what's happening in the body is that there's a massive sulfur deficiency because we are so toxic and mm-hmm. the body is trying to sulfate and get rid of a whole bunch of stuff. And then be, because we're, we're toxic and we're, we're depleting also sul- our sulfur that we are not building up as much exclusion zone water. And so like the, it all connects, right? It's all interrelated. It's so, it's so fast so yeah, fascinating to me a hundred percent and it's hard to kind of explain this from like a one thing to the next because mm-hmm. it is quantum so it's like you're talking about one thing that's related to this that's related to this that's related to that and talking about sulfur that's that's a huge thing right now especially with the use of glyphosate on mm-hmm. commercial cl- crops which interferes with the sulfation process it interferes with glycine's ability to do its job and those two things kill your exclusion zone water, kill your redox, mm-hmm. you know, it, it ties into metal toxicity. So it's, it's like, yeah, if, if you kind of understand the importance of a negative charge and the importance of sulfation in that process, um, metal detox via a sulfur-based amino acid is like a no brainer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so absolutely. anyone who's got, uh, anyone who's gotten out of immune disease, okay, Shilajit, CBD, those are like the basic things, but if you really are in a bad situation, start chelating with one of these more aggressive amino acids. And it, it literally cures most diseases fairly quickly, you know? Yeah. 
I've, I've never done, I mean, I knock on wood, I don't have any diagnosed diseases, right? I feel like I'm in a fairly thriving state, but even, even with a, but I even notice a benefit from like something like a magnesium sulfate bath, right? Mm-hmm. Just getting more uh, available forms of sulfate into the body, I think can completely maximize that, that pathway. And, you know, if someone doesn't want, if someone can't, I guess, maybe get any of these, these more potent chelators, or they're just nervous, start with a start with an Epsom salt soak, right? Mm-hmm. A regular Epsom salt soak. I've seen some pretty interesting protocols that use these Epsom salt soaks on a regular basis in conjunction with kind of these other quantum type things that we're talking about, the sunrise, the mineral status, it's powerful, it's potent, you know? And so this is kind of also where it, it, it it's like healing there's, there's a lot of different things that can kind of get, I guess, dysfunctional in the body, but he, the baseline of healing just needs a few key foundations. Mm-hmm. And you also, I would say, so like where uh, in your now, like you seem like a, a pretty thriving individual, right? What are your like non-negotiables in terms of what does your day look like? What, like, what are your non- non-negotiables that you know you need to include in order just to feel your best? Okay. I've got it. <laughs> I live so simply and yet it's so overly complex, you know, <laughs> it's like, Oh, I don't need much except for this, 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 and this. Sleep is a non-negotiable. Sleep is a non-negotiable. Yep. Um, so getting to bed by 9 PM is an absolute must for me. Um, and you know, I, I, looking back at college and some of those days where you are sleep deprived for years on end and you don't even like, I wasn't even conscientious of like what it felt like to feel good versus to feel bad. It was just like, you wake up and you know, it's the day and you feel pretty good, but you're you're not aware of what good sleep feels like until so you're true. aware of what good fe- sleep feels so like. So true. You know, let me, I, I need to pause. I want to hear because sleep is essential, but like I am, so I'm a product of college before social media. Right. Mm-hmm. And I can't, ima- and, and, and I didn't have a cell, like my cell phone was like one of those flip it open and like use yeah. it on an emergency basis. Right. <laughs> so like, and my sleep was messed up in college, right? Because that's just the culture. You stay up late to, to hang out. You stay up late to go out and socialize. You stay up late. Even if you want to just study, right. Pull it all night. Like you, you, you stay up late. And then those dorms are full of fluorescent lighting. Like it's, it's garbage. It's a hard yeah. environment. I can only imagine nowadays what it's like. Cause I know I struggled getting to bed early it, back in the day. I can only imagine now when we have screen technology and wireless radiation, like we didn't have wireless radiation on college camp- campuses back in the day. And so nowadays I feel like it's so much harder for people to get good quality sleep, uh, especially at that college age where you're already disrupting it with just natural college activities. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think the, the proof is in the pudding when you look at at least the male demographic and where testosterone levels have gone in the last 20 years where, you know, and you can take the, the 20 year analysis and you can look at the last five year analysis. And it's another one of those hockey sticks where testosterone levels are down 50%. At the, at the least. So yeah, I, I can't imagine I, I would definitely not choose to put my children through through that type of punishment if I have the choice. <laughs> right, right. But yeah, anyways, uh, a, a good night's sleep. Um, and the reason I say 9 p.m. is because you're getting that first huge growth hormone kick in your deep sleep from 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. Yep. And if you miss out on that, you don't get it. And that's another thing, uh, you know, with this kind of holistic approach is targeting growth hormone from every angle. So, you know, maximizing deep sleep is super important and growth hormone, you know, people think it's bodybuilding, it's getting big, it's all this. No, it's regeneration. It's what keeps you young. It's what repairs. Um, so yeah, uh, getting to sleep by nine, um, yeah, let's then, let, let me highlight that for people because that's a beautiful point that you brought up. Because getting, uh, it, you know, my grandma used to say, right, right, uh, like every sleep, of, every hour of sleep before midnight is worth like multiple, like uh, it's like you you get that's like a golden window, and they didn't know why, right? But they just knew that you got to get to bed as close or far away from midnight, like as early as possible, right? To maximize mm-hmm. on that. And what we now know, just so, so that people don't know, is that sleep is actually divided into two different chunks. The first chunk of sleep is body repair, right? It's physical repair of the tissues. It's rejuvenating our cells, our tissues. The second half of the sleep of sleep is more dedicated to like memory consolidation, right? And pruning synapses and things like that. 
we're missing out on timing our rejuvenation with the master hormones that are responsible for that rejuvenating effect. And so mm -hmm. that's why I absolutely a 9 PM bedtime, I would say in the summer, maybe nine 30, mm -hmm. maybe 10 o'clock, just in the middle, in the, in the middle of the summer, but absolutely like that is by far foundational getting that solid early chunk of sleep. Uh, 9 PM sounds great to me. Yeah, and definitely during the summer later, especially for us up in Michigan and Minnesota, where it's mm -hmm. it's bright until 10. Well, if the birds are still singing, you can still be up. <laughs> when the know. birds are asleep, you better be asleep. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> so that's yeah, that's definitely a, a no brainer. Um, for me, I, I think time restricted eating is another huge thing. Um, I really just tried to eat between 12 and 5 PM, mm -hmm. uh, to give your body enough time to repair and regenerate in between, you know, your eating window and the modern environment, the modern lifestyle, we're encouraged to wake up, eat breakfast by the time, you know, you're out the door, you're already getting ready for lunch, you know, work a little bit longer in an office where you haven't consumed any calories and you're, you're back home eating dinner. And it's like, you know, unless you're, unless your job is actually physically demanding, you don't need that many calories. You don't need that much food. Um, and to kind of start eating right when you wake up, well, that's going to impact your melatonin production during the day. If you're eating later at night, that's going to impact your, your secretion, um, all of that impacting sleep. So kind of eating in the middle of the day during prime time right. helps protect that sleep window. So getting to bed at nine and then protecting your sleep at both ends of the spectrum, I think are, are really important. Um, other musts, getting outside, getting sunlight. We all know that, no sunscreen, getting barefoot, getting grounded. Uh, you know, and, and you can start to feel when you're off, you know, if, if you've been inside for too long, especially these days when, you know, it's apartment living and all the conveniences you need are at the apartment and the grocery mm -hmm. store is underneath the apartment. And, you know, there's an open space within the apartment up on the fourth level. It's like, wait a second, I haven't, I haven't left this place <laughs> for a week. It's like, <laughs> That's why it feels yeah. so bad. Right, right. So, so kind of like being conscientious of that and, and making a concerted effort to go get grounded and to go get sunlight. That's a huge piece. You know, I've, I've got infrared panels, which are a good hack. Um, sauna and cold therapy are, are also another two for me because sauna, you're targeting that growth hormone. Um, and it's, it's a way to also hack working out. You know, a lot of people are diligently working out all the time for extended periods of time and, and not getting the results they want. And it's like, yeah, it starts with diet, but it also starts with working out, you know, smart. Uh, you can get the same benefits from a workout from taking a sauna and it's no impact. And, you know, even on your off days, if you're taking a sauna, um, you're not going to see muscle loss or anything like that. So, you know, I sauna way more than I work out <laughs> and, Same I, here. <laughs> and, I, and I, and I probably utilize cold therapy more than I eat. So it's, especially during the winter, cause you know, the, the whole circadian aspect, people, people look at it on a day-to-day -day basis, but it really is a seasonal basis where if you're in Northern latitude during the winter, you don't have the UV to metabolize what, you know, all the foods that you would be eating during the summer. So it's like, stay keto, stay in this natural kind of primal state and eat what you'd have access to in the wild where, you know, maybe you're scavenging a carcass, maybe you're able to, to catch a rabbit. You're not feasting on bananas from Costa Rica in the dead of winter. You know, that's like the number one no-no is, is eating fruit from a different country while you're in 30 below Minnesota darkness and, and people are like, well, I'm eating healthy. No, no, you're not. You're no. killing yourself. You might as well be smoking a pack of Mar Reds instead of eating that banana. <laughs> it's so fascinating, right? Like that is such a controversial statement when you, depending on the group of people you're talking to, right? Oh, like totally. it makes perfect sense to me, but we've just been conditioned to believe that fruit is always good for us and vegetables are always good for us. And mm -hmm. it's like blasphemy to say, no, don't, don't touch a pineapple in January. Like that's dumb <laughs> unless yeah. you live in the tropics. Right. Um, no. And so it, this is, this is cool because it's nice talking to someone else, a Northern latitude person, beca because of the fact that 
I do believe that the infrared, the sources of infrared, you know, the, they might be artificial, right? But you can also get infrared. Let's say you make a fire in your fireplace if you have one, or in your, you know, you have a camp space where you make, in your backyard you make a fire. And I think that that's, I think we have to recognize that infrared and heat were such a huge tradition that people used when they did live in Northern latitudes. And it, and that infrared is essential for so many things. So we know that, that, you know, the, the panels now, these infrared panels kind of hack it for us in a way where it's like, but we know that, that what we, what do we see when we use infrared? Well, we see it's anti-inflammatory. We see that it increases our exclusion zone water, which is an extra source of energy. We know that infrared improves melatonin, the subcellular melatonin production. I mean, there's so many things that infrared is good for. So mm -hmm. I think that it would be very difficult in, if I was in Michigan, if I didn't have sources of infrared in my life, I know what it was like before I had my, my little panel and before I had my, you know, my sauna and things like that. And I feel like winter now that I'm outside more and embracing the cold and then I come inside and I can embrace the heat. It's like winter's no big deal anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's, I guess, been one of the, the big, I guess, lines of thought that I've been having for the last few months is, you know, how to implement this circadian pattern on a yearly basis. And like, what is my body program to naturally do? And, you know, I'm you know, Christmas break. I'm, I'm, up in Minnesota, looking out the window, it's 30 below and there's the squirrel just chilling, you know, mm -hmm. yep. he's having a great day. He's not cold. He's not even thinking about the cold. He doesn't even conceptualize what cold is. <laughs> it, so, so, you know, I've, I've gotten, uh, I listened to a few podcasts and the name of the doctor is slipping my mind, but he's all about deuterium mm. and deuterium depletion. Is that Laszlo Boros? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. So I, I was listening to his stuff and uh, he advocates only living off of bone marrow that you're scavenging during the winter, which makes total sense because you're, you're getting nutrient density, you're getting fat. The byproduct of metabolizing fat is the small state hydrogen, which is essentially eliminating the deuterium load that your body has, making electron transport more efficient. So He's like, yeah, you know, if you were involved in the hunt, you're putting yourself at risk, you're burning calories, both of those things aren't selective, you know, you're, you don't have an advantage. If you're the smart guy, you're laying low in this really low metabolic state with a bone bag of all the bones you've harvested from carcasses that are preserving indefinitely, munching on them at will. And, and wow. the cold in combination with the fat, like I said, like you, you don't need calories because you've got the energy that you need from cold thermogenesis and from the, the small state hydrogen you're getting from fat. So that's mind blowing, you know, but if, yeah, you know, if we were truly in our natural state, would we be able to survive if we just transitioned from fall into winter and stayed outside and just stopped eating as much. And we're really only eating fats and, you know, minimal protein, yeah. you know, would winter really affect us? And, that that brings to mind uh Weston A. Price's book mm -hmm. where when he was going to uh, you know all these uh different uh populations across the world at the time that diets were changing at the first time that people were you know using imported wheat and imported sugar um you know he went to the Swiss Alps and he went to the lower elevation village that had all these dental problems which is one thing he correlated with the modern diet um, but when he went to the high altitude village, didn't notice any of the dental issues, but at the same time, the first thing he saw was that in the middle of winter, all the children were out running and splashing and playing in the Creek. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, you know, the less carbs, the less sugar you eat during the winter, the more cold adapted you become, the more yeah. energy efficient you are. Yeah. So that's yeah. another thing where I'm like, you know, I really want to put myself into that type of situation at some point where I'm just like, up past Duluth, Minnesota in the winter, living off like caribou carcasses. That is <laughs> talk about a documentary right there. That would be so yeah. fun. <laughs> um, yeah. So like, that's, that's really cool. I want to, that Laszlo Boros, I find interesting because he also doesn't wreck. He doesn't drink a lot of water. Yeah. He is such a believer that when you optimize your mitochondrial function, which is what Zeb was talking about, like when you optimize your mitochondrial function, 
your mitochondria make water for your cells, right? For our cells, intracellular water that then can, you know, become a lot of, go, go a lot of different places. We'll put it that way. Um, and so he's such a proponent of exactly that being very fat adapted and not even drink, having to worry about drinking water. So like, let me just talk really, really quickly, because I think what you said was so, so cool and it makes perfect sense. And I want to listen to that. What, what I want to listen to that I think, uh, on my own, just to kind of see what I can glean to from that sort of a conversation, because I like people who kind of think outside the box like Laszlo does. And what he is saying what is that when we're our mitochondria in the process of making ATP, to make that ATP, that's the fifth step of the mitochondrial electron transport chain. And the, the ATP is made when literally hydrogen molecules go through like basically like a channel, right? They, they go through their own, they kind of spin through a channel. And uh, the, I guess the rate at which the hydrogen can spin through the channel determines the amount of ATP that the mitochondria can make. And uh, oh, there's, there's different types of mitochondria. And uh, Zeb, you referred to deuterium, right? So deuterium typically... Uh, I'm sorry, there's different types of hydrogen. I'm sorry, there's different, different types of hydrogen. So deuterium is a heavy hydrogen. It's called a heavy version of hydrogen because typically hydrogen, I want you to picture it. I want people to picture it just like a basketball, right? Typically hydrogen, it's just like, it's just one proton, if you will, right? Uh, that can fit through. Um, heavy hydrogen or deuterium is, um, is double the size of regular hydrogen because it's got a neutron with it, right? So it's a proton and a neutron. And so picture what would happen if you have a basketball hoop and you're trying to shove basketballs through as quickly as possible. And now you get a double basketball and the problem it's going to, it's going to clog up the process. It's going to make uh, ATP less likely to happen. It's going to slow the electron transport chain mm -hmm. that can create mitochondrial dysfunction. And the reason why uh, we're, we talk about eating seasonally is because plants that are grown in tropical regions have way more deuterium, right? They have way more of this hydrogen that has the potential to clog up the mitochondrial electron transport chain, that fifth step, that ATPase. So it makes perfect sense why, when you think about it that way, we are meant in the winter to pair up our style of eating with a way that doesn't have a lot of deuterium. It really optimizes mitochondrial function. When we optimize mitochondrial function, we need, we need less we need less food, right? So what you're saying blends so, so many things together in such a really, really cool way. And I just wanted to highlight like how awesome it is to, like to kind of connect all these dots. So thank mm -hmm. you. And, and Carrie, your wealth of knowledge and that explanation is why you are my favorite Instagram page. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's so cool. Thank you. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I just, I'm just, you know, I'm just like, like everyone else, I'm just kind of a nerd, but I'm just grateful that there's people that want to learn about this stuff. So it's, so, it's, it's pretty cool. You know, I, I feel like this niche that we're carving out, um, I don't know. I think it could go somewhere, right? I think really it could start to change more and more lives. So it's really cool, you know, and, and I always want to give a kudos to like Jack Cruz who really started me down this journey. You know, uh, it's, uh, it's some pretty amazing stuff. Pretty amazing the, mito stuff. the mitochondriac gang, the mitochondriac <laughs> gang. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So then let's say, uh, okay. So, you know, in an ideal world, you're living off of bone marrow in the winter mm -hmm. <laughs> in the Arctic circle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what is what eating is, off the solar radiation from the Northern lights, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh yeah. That's so cool. That's so cool. So, um, what does summer look like for you? How do you switch it up? Then we're talking about winter. What does summer look like for you? So this, at least this past summer, I did start eating carbs mm -hmm. and I, you know, I, that's been a, a, a trendy thing with a lot of these health pages is this pro metabolic route. Mm -hmm. So I did go pro metabolic during the summer. And it's like, you know, if, if you think about it, it makes sense where if we've got access to honey, if we've got access to root vegetables, if we've got access to this stuff and we've got the sunlight to help metabolize it, I think you could rationalize running at a higher metabolic rate during the summer. You know, that's the time that you can put on muscle, that you can put on fat, that you can get ready for, for winter, essentially. So I, I did try that on this summer where I was going through a decent amount of honey. I was carb loading um, at dinners probably two nights a week. Um, and, and for me, that's been something that I've stayed at arm's length from for probably four or five years where I've been very hesitant to eat too many carbs for, for all those reasons. But it, it did work out well. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't have any complaints. Performance was there. I think cognition was there. Um, and, you know, like I've said in the past, I've, I've tried some of these more extreme diets, like, you know, the summer 2019, I was mostly fructarian. 
Mm -hmm. and yeah, it, what was that what was that like <laughs> it worked you know and and i i you know it it definitely stopped working in september like mm -hmm. instantly i was getting like you know some topical yeast stuff and it's like you know you just can't have that much sugar if you don't have the light to burn it um so it it, it works and you know I guess kind of segueing, uh, talking about fruitarian, talking about eating plants and carbs and stuff like that. I, I, I've dug into Steiner and, you know, my background, I went to Waldorf when I was, when I was little. So Steiner was, you know, he's a huge guy when it comes to education, super important, but he has this whole take on agriculture and was the guy who, who coined biodynamic eating, which is eating locally, source organic food was super about uh into soil health and the importance of soil health but you know to to you know i'm i'm, on, I'm in the primal camp but i'll i'll make an argument that the vegans can latch on to because <laughs> steiner and a lot of these guys were vegetarians and they believed that you know as long as you're eating biodynamically as long as you've got proper soil health which means that your food is going to have nutrient density that eating vegetables allows your body to gather, and this gets rather esoteric, but gather the astral and etheric forces that those plants contain, and that there's this, there's this kind of alchemy within the body that assembles these energies to provide the nutrients that you need in an intelligent quantum fashion, where it's not, you know, vitamin a in vitamin a out it's like all this other stuff that then builds up this kind of life force that you feed off of so i, I think oh, during ahead, the summer at, during the summer at least getting away with carbohydrates or getting away with a heavier plant-based diet especially when taking in that or taking in uh to consideration that more esoteric explanation behind it it, mm -hmm. it does make some sense um but for me maintaining that carbohydrate pro metabolic state year round does not make sense at all because you know everything correlates i mean as far as as anti-aging as far as lifespan slow metabolisms win at the end of the day so i don't know why people are intentionally trying to speed up their metabolism especially during the winter when we're supposed to be in that lowered state naturally that's, that's beautiful because I think, um, you know, our Western mindset of food is like, um, and, and what we try to do with food research, which drives me absolutely insane is like, let me isolate vitamin A or let me even worse, make a synthetic form of vitamin A. And then like, you know, figure out what its benefits are when I dose it this way to this animal for it's like we, with these isolated nutrients, they don't do a darn thing. I mean, and so, but, but we have yet to figure out science has yet science has yet to figure out what the, um, what like what's the what's the x factor what's missing like why why can't we kind of translate what we know about this particular food that's rich in this vitamin to like what we see in a lab and it's because you're exactly right you're they're missing the essence right they're missing the synergy of the energetic component of the fruit of the vegetable mm -hmm. it's something that i i mean if, if i didn't know quantum biology i would think you were so fucking woo right now saying what you said <laughs> but i totally think that it's exactly right um it's like the fact that there that there's an energetic frequency that really really built it, it provides let's just put it this way it provides a benefit and when it's consumed seasonally locally I, i'm a big carboholic in the middle of summer no, mm -hmm. no joke i love carbs and i totally will do that in the middle of summer with no detriment to my metabolism mm -hmm. whatsoever and i think it's just because of that like you said like it's it's too much it's too baby talk to say carbs are all bad all the time and it's even too baby talk to say to break up carbs into like fruits vegetables and starches or grains and say grains bad vegetables good i mean i think we have to rec take a, uh, into consideration a lot of other things when it comes to it and if we look at it from more of an energetic and a seasonal standpoint what you said makes perfect sense because mm -hmm. at the end of the day those biophotons are information and it's all light so it's like how do you kind of exude the most amount of light well I'll look at your inputs yeah. um and it's interesting when when looking at an animal because you know in Steiner's argument he's like the animal has done the grazing it's you know gathered its own nutrients and gone through this kind of uh, assembly into what is its form. So when we eat animals, we're actually shortcutting this alchemical process. Mm -hmm. So it's like 
I'd compare it to like a kid who gets his trust fund, right? Where you've got the money and you can go buy and do whatever. And it's really easy, but you're, you're losing out on the work you had to put in, which Mm. is kind of like Steiner argues we're doing when we're eating vegetables and fruit and like utilizing this alchemical assembly of energy at, at at the end of the day, I don't know what's true or what's not true. And from, from most things that I've learned, the truth is in the middle. So it's like, you know, definitely being, uh, being vegan or being fruit based in those, those times I experimented with that, you, you reach a different headspace, but you definitely suffer from like a a performance base. So it's, Mm. it's almost like you, you get a little bit, uh, more attached to, or not attached, but you kind of are in a different plane of thinking, uh, potentially a higher plane, but when you're, you know, super performance based, super protein animal based, you're in this very based kind of sense, more connected to the earth. So it's kind of this push and pull between up and down and, yeah, I guess a lot of my page, maybe you've picked up on it, can can get into the esoteric application I like of it. this stuff. But, but I love it. I love this <laughs> stuff. Do you want to, so I'll throw a little esoteric back at you. Um, I don't think I've ever stated this on my page or publicly before, but I, I oftentimes wonder if someone is looking to change their diet, right? Use diet to heal. And they um they find immediate benefit from a lot of people find immediate benefit from something like a keto or a carnivore style mm-hmm. diet, right? Pardon me, it's just like, wait a second. If I'm eating a carnivore based diet, I, I, that animal has already, like you said, processed the environmental information of the mm-hmm. vegetables, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, I, I'm, it's actually potentially strengthening my circadian rhythm because I'm not getting confusing biophotons from trying to like do a, a, a smoothie, you know, a smoothie diet. Mm-hmm. you know, all year round as like, you know, and so I'm wondering if like, if there's some component of that, I don't, I, how the heck would you research that? Right. But like, is there a, the potential that this animal already ate the plant? And so the confusion of eating bio photons out of season, right. With the wrong spin for my environment, mm-hmm. I, I take that out of the equation. And so now I'm actually eating food more in alignment with circadian rhythm, because frankly, animals would be available for most people all the time. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. It's, it's a hack. And I think that's why we see so many people going primal and going carnivore now because our modern environments necessitate that kind of hack where, you know, uh, that self assembly system of bringing in different nutrients is so compromised because of all of these negative, you know, environmental factors. Um, If you can just shortcut it and get straight to the nutrients and fast track that process, you know, especially if you're in a disease state, I think mm-hmm. it, it probably is much easier. Yeah. Yeah. So fascinating, man. I, our time is winding down, which I'm so bummed about because I, I have to have you on again at some point, or maybe we can do a, let's do a live, right? Let's do a live on Instagram at some point. Yeah, and chat more about that. this. It'd be, it'd be so much fun, but like anything else Zeb, that you want to chat about, you know, I feel like we've touched on so many really, really cool topics. Um, yeah, there, there actually is. And I yeah. think this is, this is going to be a little bit controversial, but also kind of funny. Um, there's a lot of people in the health space and especially the primal space, the circadian space right now that are, that are big on cryptocurrency as like an extension of quantum health. I know Jack Cruz is yeah, all he, about he it. Is. Absolutely. Um, and, and my background is in mining and in the precious metals industry. And I have to make the argument that gold is primal and cryptocurrency is not truly primal. So having something that's real, that's tangible, that essentially is the most condensed form of light energy, those are the precious metals. That's gold, that's platinum, that's silver. Those are the most conductive metals. So when we're talking about conductivity within the body, um, and then the you know, if you've, if you've dug into Ormus or like colloidal silver, or colloidal gold, and the benefits that you can receive from introducing that conductivity within the body, similar to what the Egyptians did, you know, precious metals were prevalent in all of the ancient civilizations for spiritual reasons and for health reasons. Um, so when we're talking about conducting free energy from negative electrons, you're more conductive when you've got gold on, when you've got uh, you know, a gold capstone on your pyramid, you've got way more impact on that electromagnetic environment. So 
uh, everyone's into crypto and I think people have done well on it and, and they're, uh, it's uh, provided them the freedom to, to jump into kind of influencer type, type health roles, which is, uh, you know, I applaud that. I was big into it back in 2017. Um, but I think fundamentally gold is the best investment option going into who knows what we're going to see in the next three to five years with the implementation of central digital currencies. You know, I, I see our current state of crypto as kind of, uh, you know, this, this segue to help uh, make the idea of a digital currency more agreeable to the common person um, and allow some people to make money off of it. Um, it's turned into this national sweepstakes where people's attention has been so distracted by tech stocks and crypto and all this stuff where we're getting these artificial uh, dopamine kicks and artificial mm. sources of what we would naturally derive be, be deriving from nature. So it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's taking attention. It's, it's an artificial source of dopamine. In, in my opinion, it's not concrete at the end of the day and to survive what's coming. I think it's, it's wise for everyone to have gold in their portfolio from a primal uh, circadian okay. perspective. <laughs> I was not expecting that, but awesome. I love that perspective. It's so good to just chat with people who really think about these things from so many different angles. Phenomenal, fascinating. So thank you. <laughs> um, <Absolutely. laughs> no, that's great. That's great. Anything else, Deb? Um, You know, I, I would say keep following Carrie because every day there's more gold that's dropped yeah. and uh, that's in the form of knowledge. And I think you've been a, a great resource um, to have synthesized all the information from Jack Cruz and Pollock and Masoro Emoto and, and all these, you know, books, everyone's familiar with them, but like to put it into a single post that's able to be read and interpreted quickly, that is shareable. I mean, it's, I mean, you've done amazing work. So I commend you for that and, and keep it up. So yeah, Thank I'm, I'm glad I, I appreciate you having me on. Um, I think it was a fun conversation and we look forward to, to chatting again sometime soon. Yeah, absolutely. And if, I would love for people to follow you as well, because you just post some really thought provoking things. So how can people best get a hold of you? Uh, I'm uh, at clearly on Instagram, C-L-R-L-Y-Y. I do have CLRLY, but I'm just waiting for my main account to get nuked before I fire that one up. So it's, uh, <laughs> Instagram at CLRLYY uh, or clearly.com, CLRLY.com. Great. Awesome, Zeb. So nice chatting with you. Let's do it again soon. Absolutely. Okay. Take care. Bye.